Good evening. Good to see you here tonight. And uh, glad that you could be here. We are in the middle of a series at the moment uh, in which we're talking about things that have to do internally with the church. And there's a couple things we'll get out of the way. I announced a couple of them this morning. Uh, one, VBS is coming up. Be sure to invite. Bring your friends. And we gave the challenge to the kids that if they bring at least four, at least four guests, then they will be given at the end of the week an egg, and they can choose to either throw that at Alan, Andrew, or myself. And the child, child, who brings the most visitors, tallied up through the week and verified, we must get documentation for that to be official, we will break many eggs into a bucket, and they will get to pour that bucket of eggs on either myself, Alan, or Andrew. Uh, if they're very clever, they could do all three. Uh, we'll see. So do invite people. We want to con uh, connect people to our church. We want people to see that uh, God is very real and that you can learn about him through the Bible and you can experience him in life and that God is very supportive of people. There's really great lessons that are going to be here. There'll be fun games and things as well, but we really want to connect our community to God's word. And so your capacity to invite people, uh, to include people in that is really, really important. And uh, we hope you take advantage of that. Uh, we're going to have kids' classes. We're going to have adult classes. It's going to be for the community. And so we're very thrilled about that opportunity. Second of all, this morning, I did tell you all that we're testing the Wi-Fi. Thank you to everyone that did send in the data. That was super, super helpful. Tonight, we're going to do one more test. Uh, we did have over 117 people that were online at that particular time. And that was super uh, useful. Tonight, if you have that password, and if you would not mind first turning down the volume on your phone, what I would ask you to do, beginning right now, if you could start a YouTube video or start playing a, a video throughout this so we can test the capacity of the Wi-Fi, what we've asked our people to do is so if everyone uses it at the same time, will it still work? That's what we want. We'll only know that if we have everyone doing a heavy load at the same time. So right now, if you are on the WACOC guest network, uh, and you could play a YouTube video. You could live stream us. That'd be kind of weird as you're sitting there uh, watching yourself as we uh, go through our worship service. Any sort of video, that takes a lot of data. And if we do that at the same time, we want to push it the limits of the system and test it. And uh, then I will test what we get up here. So if you don't mind doing that, you don't have to watch it. Just sit down and let it play in the background on your phone. That would be helpful, okay? Let's jump into Hold the Fort. We've been using kind of a Western theme to talk about some internal matters of the church. We were going to look at church culture tonight. What is our church culture? And why does that even matter? Hold the fort. Now, if you watched Westerns at any point, you've probably heard that phrase, hold the fort, or some variation, hold down the fort. Typically what that meant was why leadership was gone. You were to take care of the fort or the area that you existed in. It may mean that you protect it. It may mean the, the, the volume thing first, volume thing first. Um, that's okay. It may mean that you're in the fort and you just keep it functioning. Get food to the people that need food. Give medical care to the people that need medical care. Keep it clean. Whatever your task normally is, keep that running. And keep it running really well until leadership comes back. That's typically what it meant. And you would hear all kinds of variations of it. Now, if there's a theory that, that first came out in the Civil War and that, that there was General Sherman called out to a fort and he's the first one to issue this and said, hold the fort, I'm coming. And there's a lot of lessons been given over that. Historically, that's not actually accurate. Uh, he did give some variation uh, of, of it. And this is according to uh, the Facts on File Dictionary of Clichés. And the actual words on record were, hold out, relief is coming. Which is still, you get the idea. But in the 1940s and 50s and Westerns that thrived during the uh, 20th century, hold the fort became a very popular idea, mostly in Westerns. And you get it. You kind of get it. Out West, as people traveled in our American history, there was a sense of hope. There was a sense of possibility, but also there was a lot of dangers and things that would take place. And if you were not careful, things might fall apart. So you can understand, hold the fort. It could be your livestock would wander off. It could be that diseases would come into your encampment. Hold the fort. Take care of the people and do what you need to do. There was a sense in that old West that as you'd structures were built up and they were trying to establish a community in there, people really had to work a lot to come together. It was important to do that in reality. 
Now, in Hollywood, in the Westerns we talked about, most of these forts were fake. And so initially we want to give a warning, let's not be those kinds of people. Pretend Christians. A pretend church. Why? Because the idea of holding down the fort, taking care of business until the master returns, that's so biblical, isn't it? It's so biblical. We know, in fact, we anticipate a day, if we're faithful, that Jesus will come back. In Acts chapter 1, uh, as he was ascending into heaven, the angels told him, why are you looking this way? He's going to come back. He's going to come back. In Thessalonians, we get the people that are worried that uh, their family and their friends that are Christians or died, they may miss it. And Paul writes to them, tells them to be comforted and look forward to that day, which will be a shout, it will be the sound of the trumpet, the voice of the archangel, and Jesus will come again. And this is a thing that we should be comforted about, we should be excited about. He's coming again. But he's gone for now. And in the span of when he left until he comes back, that was the idea that the Christians would take care of the church, that the Christians would look out for one another, that the Christians would uphold the values and they would uphold the beliefs and they would take care of the kingdom until he came back. That's what the expectation was. Hold the fort. There's times they did it really, really well. There's times utterly fell apart. Really, it did. And there were consequences because of that. But we get the idea. Jesus even told people about it. Go to Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, we get this parable that Jesus gives. And there's many he did in which there's an example of a master going away, leaving the servants to do a job, whether it's tend to vineyards or take care of talents or whatnot. And then he would come back and there would be an assessment of how things were to be done. And in this one, it's very eschatological. He definitely is looking to the end times. And he know that because of the way he leads into it. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. I'm in verse 32 of Mark chapter 13. Nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 33. Take heed, watch, and pray. For you do not know when the time is. It is like a man. Here he goes into the parable part. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest, coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch, watch. These are the words of Jesus encouraging, given authority, given responsibility, given honor to uphold and maintain his house, the church. And he's speaking this in these words to all of us who are Christians. It may be easy to think to ourselves, that's someone else's job. But you couldn't do that if you're holding down the fort. It's the entire community's responsibility to participate in that. And I need you to think about that for a second, why that matters. Every single person's contribution matters. If in the Old West, you know, the person watching the fort, looking out for people that may come, bandits or whoever, he doesn't do his job, people are going to get hurt. Lives are going to be lost. If those who were to give medical care were to suddenly not show up, people are going to get sick, lives are going to be lost. The people who are supposed to go out and find food and resources that are necessary don't do the job. Lives are going to be lost. People are going to suffer unnecessarily because people didn't take on the responsibility. You can see where it goes as you expand that out to the teachers and the the people that were farmers and the field workers, the people that cleaned, the people that built. Every single person contributed for a single vision. And it wasn't just that they were like an organization. It was more like they functioned as an organism, a singular mind. And that should resonate with us as Christians who are told, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ, that we would have a singular purpose. Sure, we have variety. Absolutely, we have variety. This doesn't mean that we have to all like the same music or we all have to have the same favorite hymn or the same favorite passage. But a singular purpose Maintaining the fort, looking out for one another, even in a sacrificial sense. That's what we need to have. 
And when that happens, we're not talking about just existing in the church, but actually being a part, a meaningful part. And whether you feel like your part is grandiose, you shouldn't, it's just your part. Or you feel like your part is very, very tiny, you shouldn't, it's your part. God has deemed to each of us a different degree of responsibilities, and none of us get to lift ourselves up and say, I'm the best. No, you're just given more responsibility. But you still need to serve. And you don't ever say, I'm meaningless, and I don't have very much. No, you've been given a responsibility, and you still need to serve. It requires everyone, and that's the mentality that we need to have. That's the mentality. Now, this doesn't function in the same way that does in the world overall, because you'd imagine the master comes back and he would go through and itemize quickly and scowl and you failed or you did really good. I like Luke's version of this. He gives a similar parable, but when he talks about the master coming back, it's a wildly different concept of it. And it's because our master, our God is not like men. It's well beyond that which tells us a couple things, the value we need to put on maintaining his fort, his home, his kingdom, but also understanding who we serve. And if we understand the generosity and the love and the care and the majesty of God, maybe that ought to inspire us to give even greater care to his kingdom. In Luke chapter 12, as he gives, a, like I said, a similar thing about the going away and the coming back, he describes the, the servants being doing their job, unless they be kept sleeping. But if they do their job, if they do their responsibility, live in that honor that God has given them, he says this in verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself, have them sit down to eat, and will come and serve them. Wow different sort of kingdom than we're in. Our great God, unlike many others who are, you know, in the the world would say, elevate me up and you give all things to me and you pithy worms, how honored are you to serve me? That's not our God at all. Our God who gave us this kingdom, who gives us this community, who gives us the scope of this world, gives and gives and gives and makes it possible for us to be a part of it, who wants us to be a part of it, who will help us to be a part of it, on top of all of that, even beyond what we deserve, give us every provision that we could want and need and even more, says, when he comes back, let me serve you. Come eat this feast. What a wild concept. It's so counter to the world. It's so counter to the world. But it's exactly God-like. And that concept of the fort that we work in makes all the difference in the world. And that should motivate us to a large degree. So have a high value for it, for sure. One of the phrases that absolutely kills me, absolutely kills me, is when we're doing a work and someone says something along the lines, and you may have heard it, may have been tempted to say it, may have actually said it. It's just the church. It doesn't matter. Just just get a thing done. It's just the church. it's, It's not that big a deal. Doesn't that hurt a little bit? Because they're saying the church isn't that important. It's not worth the extra effort. It's not worth the extra effort to put in a little bit more, to give excellence. That's what it's implying. That's what it's saying. No one cares. It's just, it's just church. So just throw it together. Just throw something together. But we're doing a thing for Jesus' kingdom. We're doing a thing for Jesus' kingdom. And if we are doing the work for the kingdom, how can we possibly think it's good enough or it doesn't matter? Just just throw something together. Slop it together. Did God ever slop something together for us? Never. Did God just give us the crumbs? Never. God blessed us and blesses us and continues and will bless us even more. Gives us way more than we deserve. How can we be people who says it doesn't matter? Just give a little bit. Even with VBS, with their Bible classes, with their tendency to talk about the church. How can we just say it doesn't matter or give a little bit or worse, tear it down? Tear it down. So when we talk about holding the fort, and here's where I'm moving toward in this, how do we do that? What does that actually look like, holding down the fort? Yeah, on the one hand, I have mentioned that we have our own responsibilities, and some of you are teachers. 
Some of you are very compassionate people, and man, you can give good advice and good counsel. And when people are going through emotional roller coasters, you're there for them. Some of you are behind the scenes, very, very skilled at encouraging in very, very subtle ways. It's powerful when you do that. Some of you have such a servant's heart that when we ask you to do something or you see a need, you jump on it, man. You jump on it. Those things for sure are great. Worship service, even caring about the quality of our worship service, whether it's for those here or for those online, and making sure that what we do is done really well for the Lord, but it's in such a way that people can tell these people care about God. They're holding down the fort. This isn't a game for them. This isn't a pretend version for them. They're not actors on a Hollywood show pretending to be Christians, like in the old westerns in the 1950s. They're the real deal. It's authentic. It's very genuine. How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we do that? We've got to find a way to generate love for the kingdom. It just doesn't happen. It's not a magic thing that you get. Suddenly you do it. It doesn't mean that you just walk into the church every Sunday and there it is. I guess I did my job for the kingdom. How do you generate that over time? A bit of that goes back to what we talked about this morning. The more you understand God and the impact he's had on your life, the stronger your faith will be, it's based in the Bible, and the more understanding you have will give you a greater opportunity to appreciate all that he's done. And that appreciation can drive you. It can drive you. The more you are around his people, the more you can appreciate them and care for them and lean on them. It will make all the difference in the world. It will strengthen you. There's a glue to that. But how do we get to that? You ever think about some of the scriptures that Jesus gave? The ones that even that you learn as a little kid, and there's a good reason you learn them as a little kid. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We want that to be known and understood. Sure, at a little kid level, but very much at an adult level, that is a mind-blowing and overwhelming thing to understand. God loved you so much, he died for you. Who would do that for you today? Who would do that for you today? I bet you got a couple of maybes. I bet you got a lot of maybe nots. And I bet you got even more than definitely nots. That's the nature of people. But God, God himself died for you. And on top of that, he told you how to be with him. So great. And he also gives us his instructions on how to be righteously, how to live righteously. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, the golden rule. Whatever you would have men do to you, do to them. There are variations of that, depending on your translations. What a simple thing to think about. Challenging things to do. But there's a thing that's really special about that. We teach kids to be kind and good in that regard, but as an adult, as you grow over and mature, even as an older adult, the way that you practice that, you begin to think, well, really, that's not about me so much, is it? I treat people the way I want to be treated. Okay, that communicates a thing, doesn't it? It communicates to people, this is the sphere and the realm that I hope that you would give me. Love, respect, and honor. And many of us share those things together. We want those things, kindness, to be lifted up, to be encouraged, to be corrected when we're kind of off base. We want those things because we want to be better people. We want to communicate that because we, we give that to people as well. We, we treat people in that way. There's a maturing that comes with that. And at first, it's like we think of it in the negative sometimes when you're little. Don't be mean because I don't want people to be mean to me. Okay. Don't say bad things to people because I don't want you to say bad things to me. But the flip side of that, be really good to people. Be really decent to people because I want that to me. We have those verses. Love one another as I have loved you. John 13, verse 34. A very, very common verse. There's a simplicity to it, and then there's the magnitude of how. How do I do that every day perfectly? I don't, but I get better at it day after day. And I've got to find ways. I hear that verse, and I was like, okay, be kind, be good, and whatever, do things for people. But then there's a point where you realize I've got to try to do it better every day. 
I mean, I've got to get deliberate about it every day. Otherwise, I'll just coast. And if I coast at it and just say, yep, I love people. They're all basically good or whatever. And don't really mean it and don't really put the actions into it. I'll never develop the feelings for it at all. And then it'll just become a thing where I just kind of generically drift along. Yeah, yeah, I love, love people. And then that might fade into a bad habit. But if I take responsibility for that and build on that, and look for ways daily to show that love to people, oh, now I'm doing something a little bit different, aren't I? I'm giving, and I'm looking for ways to give. I'm engaged in the activity of community. I'm engaged in the way of expressing God's love to other people. There's a maturing that goes on in that. How do we hold down the fort? We live according to those scriptures. Be holy, for I am holy. God said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Be holy, for I am holy. All right. That means I can't give in to sin. I've got to cut sin out of my life. That means I've got to live righteously. Basic verse. And I have a general understanding of that. Don't cuss, don't drink, don't have sexual immorality, don't, don't beat up people, don't throw a fit. Okay, fine. But be holy might have a bigger picture to it that I've got to mature into. Be holy. Live righteously. It might mean that I start being more forgiving, more merciful, more kind. Because those are God things. And God is holy, so let me be holy. It may be that there's moments that I get really frustrated and really tired and I see someone doing something wrong and my inclination is, oh, let me get them. But, yeah, man, God has the right to do that, but... How patient is he with us? Be holy might be that extra long suffering for people. And when you have that temptation to tear down the people in the church and your community, you stop. Because it doesn't just tear down that person, it tears down the whole community, the church. And when the people on the outside of the fort hear that, what's their inclination to think about the fort, the church, the kingdom? They're fakers, not real. They turn on themselves. They turn on themselves. I see in the Bible it's not supposed to be anything like Jesus wasn't that kind of person. So shouldn't I expect them to be like Jesus? But if on the flip side, they hear us talking about quite honestly and in truth the very good things and they see the holiness that we live in our lives and we strive for. We're not perfect. We'll repent. We'll improve. But we're striving for it every day. They're going to draw a connection that there's something very real in that. They're living holy. They are avoiding the sins. They're not making excuses for it. And that's some of the worst things ever. My least favorite is when someone does something, or they say something really cruel, and there's some chuckles. I was just joking. I was just joking. Why are you acting like it hurts you? I'm just joking. As if that's an excuse. It drives me up the wall. It's like you're trying to pretend it's not cruel, but you know it's cruel in the midst of it. You're a Christian. Cruelty should not be a part of your vocabulary or your actions. Be holy for I am holy. All right. That's some of it. Holding down the fort at the most basic level. But I think a really important thing to think about in holding down the fort is the way that we, the way we create the culture of our community. We'll do that with those verses, but there's another level of it where we must be very very deliberate. I always think about the passage where Jesus talks about wisdom, uh, to be gentle as doves and wise as serpents. And I always think about that. Man, he wants us not just to just let things happen and hope for the best, but to really be wise in this. Never think about the opportunities we have to create a culture in our congregation. All of us. Now, it's true that leadership will set a tone. That's a fact. But there's a participation that has to go in that for every single person. We create the culture of our congregation, what the norms are for values, what our language is in terms of lifting people up or tearing people down. What's the common thing that happens? Or if a sin does pop up, what's the culture of how we manage that? Do we hide it? Do we sweep it under a rug? Or do we confront it and seek forgiveness and repentance? What's the norm of that? What's the culture of our congregation? If a visitor comes in to see us, what's the culture of the congregation to establish hospitality? That's a big one that we have to focus on. But it's not just for the visitors either, is it? What's the culture of hospitality 
for our older established members, the people that's been here for years? What is it for our new members? What is it for the people that just passed through? And what are the people that's been here a little while? How welcome do we make people feel? What does that look like? How much do we talk to one another? I mean, honestly, when we engage. I was so happy to see Jerry this morning. Haven't seen Jerry in a long time. Come back from West Virginia. It was just a natural thing. Give each other a hug because that's what Christians do. I hope you felt welcome and not attacked, Jerry. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. What's the norm that takes place in this? And do we extend that to each other and congratulate one another and engage with one another? It's so easy to come in. We're kind of a mid-sized, small to mid-sized church. I hope we get even bigger and the culture is expecting that kind of growth. But what I hope happens is that we don't stay strangers just because we're on opposite ends of the building. Or we don't stay strangers because, you know, we're not willing to get up and engage. And I know it's a little uncomfortable sometimes. You ever been in the situation, and, you, and this may hold you back a little bit, it really may. I, I hate and love the situation. I enjoy awkward situations sometimes, maybe a little too much. But you ever been in that situation, it's like, oh man, so glad you could come visit with us today. I've been a member for five years. <laughs> You've been in that situation? That has caused people to be on our visitation team and off our visitation team. Because we don't want to engage with that kind of awkwardness. There's other ways to deal with that. Hey, have we met before? That's a safer way to start that conversation. When did we meet before? That's a safer way to start that conversation. So you can get in to actually know each other. Don't run from it. Don't run from it. Just because you haven't seen them around and it doesn't quite register, there's a way to navigate. If we're holding down the fort, we will find a way to navigate. Not run from the situation, but we'll run to engaging with people, especially those we're not yet familiar with. How soon do we scoot over in our seat and make room for people? How willing are we to see someone who doesn't know where they're going? And do we think somebody will get to them when we can do it ourselves? How many times have you thought, I better get so-and-so to take care of a situation when you are more than capable of doing it yourself, engaging the situation? How hospitable do we make it for one another? And how much do we challenge, you know, not making people feel welcome? You ever been to a church? It better not be this one. Where you come in and the first thing people do is they, oh. And you know they're thinking, they're not, they're thinking I don't dress like them. And that just shuts, out. it puts a wall up immensely over such a thing that shouldn't be the first thing we engage with. Or there's a doctrine that you throw out first that puts up a wall. Okay, we don't believe in whatever. You lead with that? You don't even know the person. Okay, well, I don't know if you know this, but here we do. That's how you first start a conversation? There is no way that makes someone feel welcome. Oh, you did a good job explaining your values, your doctrine and stuff, and that's very good. You could be the soundest congregation in the nation and yet have the most toxic culture, the most off-putting community, and cause no one to come and participate. You know why? Because other congregations have the same Bible and will teach the same truth just as strongly and they'll also be very welcoming and they'll also be very hospitable and they'll also make sure that you know that you belong here and we need to give everyone that feeling. Not faking it, but meaning it. We're not actors. We're the real deal as Christians. And if we're holding down the fort, we will make people know that they belong here. And beyond that, we'll make sure they know it's a safe space. That's the second most important thing we can do. It's safe. What do we mean by that? We do have discussion groups, and that's a safe space. I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Last week's lesson, this week's lesson, and next week's sermon, we're all going to sum up, and then the following week, uh, what is that, the 23rd of June, we're going to have a discussion group about these topics. We have a safe space where it's okay to talk about these things. And some of you all have shared some really amazing things, very personal things, but it's been a safe space. I respect the fact that you're willing to be that vulnerable, that open, and I also respect the other members that allow that and encourage that so we can actually discuss it. If we don't have a space where that can take place, where people can be vulnerable with their faith, with their emotions, with what they're going through, real life, we're not holding down the fort. That's the community that Jesus wanted us to be able to have, to actually work through things. 
Perhaps it's been at some point you've had that moment where you wanted to talk with somebody about something because you've been struggling. Hey man, I've been struggling with this sin. And the response was, oh, God doesn't want you to do that. What? Yeah, I know. That's why we're talking about it. It's a missed opportunity, isn't it? I was listening to a podcast about a guy who was talking about this thing, and he, he, he phrased it that way. That's a missed opportunity. You have an opportunity at that point to show vulnerability, to show a safe space, and to tell them, hey, man, there's things I struggle with as well. I struggle as well. And here's how I've looked at the Scriptures, and we've navigated that. Can we pray about that together? Isn't that the kind of community that Jesus wanted us to have? Isn't that the kind of community that when we do that for one another, we're actually living as Christians and we're really building people up rather than pushing away? There was a sense for a long time that if you were a Christian and you were in a church, you must present yourself as the most perfect person possible. Nobody believed you were actually perfect, but you've got to present yourself that way. And if you showed a hint of vulnerability that you may have sinned or even been tempted, yeah, you ain't a real Christian. That's shameful. That is shameful. That's the time we weren't holding down the fort. We couldn't even be honest about our struggles with each other. And it made our relationships cheap. And it made our relationships fragile. And it was not a safe place. There was no hospitality in that. It wasn't the reality of being a Christian. Oh, I don't think it should also turn into a big self-help session at all, to be honest. But there needs to be a place where we can go to one another. Dealing with our temptations and trials. Going to the Word together going to Jesus together and finding a way to navigate that. That needs to be a goal that we uphold in holding down the fort. we got to do that for one another. Not a one of us is perfect, but we're going to try. But we got to do that together. It's important we do that together with realistic expectations. So once we've established our hospitality, once we've established the fact that we can be vulnerable, that this is a safe place for that, we find our purpose. And when we find our purpose in moving as a church, and in our congregation we've established several things, you'll hear this rolling out more. Last year I did the whole series on it over through the whole year about the importance of evangelism being a key factor in our congregation because we must share the word. Outreach is a factor that we must play in our community. There are people in our community that do not know we exist. You say, they see our building. Do they see us? Do they see God's people? Do they know when you say, I'm a member of Washington Avenue Church of Christ, they go, yes, I know exactly who you people are. You are the people that make a difference in our community. Or on the flip side, if we were to disappear, would they even notice? Would they even notice? That's holding down the fort. Not because we're flashy. Not because we're full of ourselves. Not because we're self-righteous. But because we impact people's lives. Because we go out into the community and serve. Because they know that we're people of the Bible. Because they know that we're people that love. That we know that they're people that are saying, hey, we're struggling. We say, we're here for you. With the resources we have, we're here for you. They'll know who we are. They'll know who we are. But they got to see us doing that for ourselves, and they got to see us willing to go out. It's what Jesus did. Sometimes people came to Jesus, but many times Jesus went out to the crowds and into the houses and into the synagogues and into the midst of the people. And it looked scary sometimes, but he still went. And so that the crowds grew because they knew Jesus mattered. Maybe they didn't fully understand all the time, but they knew he mattered. And that's why they generated those crowds to just listen to him. That's why last week, Sunday morning, we talked about the tax collectors and the sinners wanted to listen to him because they knew he mattered. We have his words. We have his mind. We are his people. We need to matter to our community as well. That's holding down the fort. Once we have this circling around together and we have that love for one another, we're living by those verses, we have a safe space, we've got our purpose, we can move as an organism, singular mind, singular faith, following a singular God and rejoicing in it, being blessed. This is a glorious life that we have. Holding down the fort, not a burden, a joy. It's peaceful because I know i got people I can count on and I know i got God who's always here with me. I know if there's a struggle, i got people I can turn to. 
That's holding down the fort. That's a blessing, not a burden. It's a blessing, not a burden, because we know we have the truth. We don't have to guess the pathway to God. We don't have to guess how to do it. He's given us that. And we also have his promises and his truth. And we live in them, and we encourage one another in them. What a blessing we have. We of all people, and we should enjoy those blessings together, celebrate them, and make sure that we talk about that with one another and out in the world as well. It's a glorious thing to be a Christian, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you think about holding down the fort until Jesus comes again. It's not just a hobby we do. It's not just a part-time thing we do, only on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's every day until he comes again. Make that a joy because you choose to do your part. It's not somebody else's job. We need every single Christian here today. And if you're not yet a Christian, we need you too. And we want to help you become a Christian. We'll close out with that tonight, our invitation. Not yet a Christian, but you could be. You absolutely could be. Not yet a Christian. You ever consider what's holding you back from that? What's keeping you from making that decision? You may say, I'm, I'm just not ready, but do you have a clearer answer than that? That's not really an answer. I say that to people all the time. I, you know, maybe not right now. Why? If you're of an age where you are honestly able to consider whether you should be a Christian or not, and you don't have an answer, you need to get that answer. Your soul is too important. Your salvation is too important. It is not a gamble. It's not a thing you should take lightly. You need an answer. And whatever it is that makes you think, not now, fix it. Fix it is a deliberate phrase because it's a problem. And it's a problem you don't have to have. You've got people willing to go through that with you and solve that problem. And you may think it's too big. I promise you it's not for God. It's absolutely not too big a problem for God. It may be complicated, you think. Not for God you got people who are willing to love you, to teach you, to be there. What's holding you back? If nothing, then do what's right. Do what you need to do. Don't hesitate. Whatever you do have a need in, let us know. We'd love to serve you and be here for you. Let us know as we stand and as we sing.